Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to today's event, sponsored by Software AG and hosted by American Banker, titled Opening Banks to Innovation. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that today's web seminar is being recorded and you're currently in listen-only mode. Now I'd like to acquaint you with some of the ways you can participate during the presentation. The On24 room allows you to adjust and resize all available panels that appear on your screen. To resize any of the panes, just click the lower right corner of the panel and drag to adjust. To move the pane, just click the top title bar of that panel and drag it anywhere within the console. We will have a question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. The Q&A pane is available for you on the left portion of your screen. Type your question into that window and hit submit and your question will be logged into the queue and we'll take as many questions as we have time for. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, enter your question into the Q&A window stating your technical issue and I'll be happy to assist. Now without further delay, let's begin today's event sponsored by Software AG and hosted by American Banker. I'd like to introduce your moderator for today and that is Mike Berkowski. Mike, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's program. We're glad that you could join us to learn a little bit more about opening banks to innovation. I'm Mike Perkowski. I'll be your moderator. We're glad that you could take a little bit of time out of your busy days. And we would like to get started in a moment. Before we do, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank Software AG for their sponsorship of today's program. We appreciate their support. Our main presenter today is Laura Crozier, Global Banking Director at Software AG. Laura is a financial services veteran with 25 years experience on the business side across the front, middle, and back offices of global banks. She started in capital markets at BMO and ended up for responsibility for global web channels at RBC Investor Services. She joined Software AG in September 2016. Laura has an MBA and holds the Chartered Financial Analyst designation. So with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Laura Crozier. Laura, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about a very exciting um, uh, technology that is really helping banks to change. But just a bit about us so that you uh, know how we are seeing and helping banks uh, transform using open APIs. Uh, we have been around for 50 years now, which is hard to believe. Uh, and in our current business, one of our three key focus tech uh, industries is financial services. And I did an exercise where I looked across our financial services customers and through our uh, integration and messaging platform, I was able to uh, identify that we move more than $30 trillion in payments per year. And of course, that is uh, growing all the time. And we also work with 10 of the 15 of the largest global banks, uh, excluding the current uh, the Chinese banks right now. So our topic for today is innovation with APIs in financial services. And of course, when we talk about APIs, uh, you know, uh, they're old hat technology internally within banks for internal integration. But what we're doing is looking where this is going to take banks over the longer term. Uh, open APIs, where banks are sharing data outside, consuming APIs, which is all leading to a new business model of being much more of a platform and creating experiences from ecosystems for banking clients. And this is really going much more from a cost and compliance focus to a new revenue focus. And I think PwC put the opportunity really, really well and crystallized the future, the potential in this quote. By making data systems available to third parties, financial institutions can expand their addressable market, achieve product diversity, and commercialize core systems. And in fact, McKinsey has a great quote about this by extending data and systems out to an ecosystem of partners, banks have the opportunity to extend the redressable market in 2025 by four trillion in just the retail market to some 40 trillion in the consumer digitally distributed 
uh, economy. So it's uh, a fascinating potential and really the question of, you know, big fish, big fish, small pond, or being a player in a much larger, richer pond. So what I'd like to do now is talk about three customer stories. Two of these happened uh, just in 2018. They're all FSIs, and we've all helped these financial institutions to reinvent themselves in the face of digital disruption. The first is a European bank. The second is a leading Asian insurer. And the third is a Eurozone nas national clearinghouse. So the first uh, customer of Software AG I'd like to talk about is a large bank in the Eurozone who is getting ready for growth through a new payment service. This is uh, an Italian banking group that serves over 2 million clients with 1,300 branches, um, and it has businesses that go across even corporate investment banking, wealth management insurance, leasing, factoring, and consumer credit. And of course, you know, on this side of the pond, we've heard about PSD2. What I'd like to do is address this, this payments regulation just very quickly, just because the uh, illustrations I'm going to give you, these client examples, show how these clients have decided, yes, to be compliant, but have made strategic decisions to go beyond mere compliance, which actually could be a competitive threat in terms of becoming disenfranchised from end customers. So, you know, what is PSD2? Uh, it's an EU regulation, just like the open banking regulation in the UK. And the intent of it is to level the playing field between the traditional big banks and fintech challengers, and to provide end customer control over their data. So it's really the democratization of that data. There's three main impacts of things that partic market participants have to do. They have to provide data so that there can be account aggregation, so that you can look at all of your accounts in one dashboard. There has to be the ability to initiate payments through a third-party payment provider. And there are technical standards that specify levels of security. So this was one challenge that this European bank was facing. And of course, they wanted to become compliant with this regulation, but they also had a desire to explore, exploit data across the business to open up new revenue opportunities. And they also wanted a better ability to compete with a lot of the new market entrants who are very agile. So what did they do? Well, instead of just being compliant, which would involve developing and publishing APIs, they decided to adopt API management across the life cycle and ensure that they would have both the ability to have visibility and agility to launch new products and indeed a new payment service, but also have the ability to have governance and controls over the APIs and data and systems being shared. So first of all, they were defining and designing APIs, which is really the business-driven activity and it's aligned with business strategy, ideally designed from the outside in to capture customer interest, and then developing and publishing APIs, the traditional technical tasks of making APIs uh, easy to be used by developers in order to gain adoption, build and grow networks of developers and partners, and then introducing the ability to manage and retire APIs. And this is really key. To be able to monitor that APIs are satisfying the original objective from a business perspective, to manage the API like a product, and analyze how the APIs are performing from an economic perspective. Are they on plan for monetization? And make APIs easy to use for developers internally through an API catalog so that capabilities from uh, published APIs can be reused, and also analyze APIs to see where they can make improvements. And of course, security and governance that only approved third parties are actually receiving data and, and that the data controls are uh, very, very robust. And of course, like all products, eventually the APIs will be retired. 
So what was the result of this uh, Eurozone Bank introducing API management? Well, certainly compliance with PSD2 was accomplished. Controlled API perspective with enforced security and traffic management, uh, exposing APIs in a safe and secure way. Governance through one dashboard providing visibility to enable the banks to monitor all APIs and expose data and services. Security, more secure handling of data because of the ability to monitor service times and errors and avoiding web attacks and provide, preventing systems issues. And importantly, growth. There's a phenomenal growth expected in transactions. In fact, a 900% increase is expected in 2020 alone because of a launch of a new payment service enabled through API management. So this is all fueled by an ability to respond to external data sharing requests at twice the speed of previous. And I think that the, um, the, uh, one of the, the uh, vice presidents of IT at the client said you know, really clearly that API management has enabled them to be ready to compete in an era of new banking, launching a new type of payment service, and the really key being agile and being able to respond to new demands. And new demands, of course, that can't be anticipated now, but will be happening in the future. So that's our first client story, a large Eurozone bank deciding to be, of course, be compliant, but going beyond that to launch a new payment service and compete with up and coming digital competitors. Now our next story is a little bit different, but this is very interesting. AIA is the largest independent publicly listed pan-Asian life insurance group. It has a presence in 18 mar markets across Asia PAC. And it actually has the modest goal of becoming the world's preeminent life insurance provider. It's 100 years old now. And what their goal was is to change the dynamic of the traditional life insurance model. Now, I'm sure all of us on the call have some type of life insurance, and whether it's you know, through or, or health insurance, and whether that's through your employer or you have that independently, typically you know, the, the contact that we usually have with the insurers is when we're negotiating the policy or when we're sending in a claim, and very frequently you have agents in the middle which has meant that life insurers have had one of the least, uh, lowest rates of customer engagement out of any industry. So they wanted to change this. They wanted to uh, be involved in the uh, insured's uh, life in order to enable cross-sell, upsell, to deliver a superior customer experience, and also to streamline operations. So how did this work? They very creatively decided to introduce something called the AIA Vitality Wellness Program. And this is a vehicle to bring about business benefits through digitalization in three ways. First of all, by enabling the end insured customers to use their wearable devices and sync it with the AIA Vitality app on their smart device. They were able to provide information on a voluntary basis to AIA about their health. So AIA was gathering customer intelligence, lead generation, and number two, they were, had the opportunity for the customers to proactively improve their health, which of course means lower risk for an insurance company, and customers are incented to do this because they are rewarded to do this. They, have, they are rewarded through a point system that they can redeem for various things, whether it's movie vouchers or um, uh, discounts at hotel chains. So in all in all, the gamification you know, drives customer intelligence a better customer engagement that is direct 
and it is at positive times of celebration, not just at a time of acclaim, and also a better customer experience. And just very briefly, you know, you can take a look at how robust this eco ecosystem that AIA Vitality has developed. You know, so participants earn points for good behaviors, and then they receive those rewards. And AIA has the ability to have insight for upsell, cross-sell, and also risk reduction through better insight into lifestyle choices. And the outcome of this was compared to other alternatives by uh, us working with them and also other pieces of our integration platform, they were able to get to market in half the time. Cutting costs by a third versus uh, previous efforts, and they have really established themselves as a leader in this gamification and the insurance uh, uh, industry and have been rolling this out in Asia and then also into Europe. So they've really changed the dynamics of uh, what an insurer is and they are uh, pursuing their goal to become a preeminent life insurer globally. Now one last customer story and this also takes place in Europe. The catalyst was also a um, uh, PSD2, but this Eurozone National Clearinghouse wanted to extend its role beyond just being compliant with, uh, uh, on an individual basis, with PSD2, but they wanted to provide the capability for regional banks to become compliant as well. So in this uh, clearinghouse, this country, there are 100 plus small banks that need a ready-made solution to serve them. There is, uh, it, all across Europe, demanding e-commerce se sector for payment services with cash, cash usage declining rapidly. And of course, there are many hotbeds of uh, fintech, uh, uh, fintech incubators, fintech markets in Europe with a lot of openness from uh, existing incumbents to be collaborating with them. And also pursuing this route with supporting the national digital strategy of this in uh, Clearinghouse's home market. And of course, this was all uh, had the underlying catalyst of PSD2 that I talked about right at the beginning of this, uh, of this call. So what did the uh, clearinghouse do? Well, first of all, what they did was they introduced API management into a payments hub so that they could be communicating with these 100 plus regional banks that would be working directly through them either in, in initiating payments or responding to. They were working with third party payment providers, which you'll recall is a piece of uh, the PSD2 requirements and also providing account information to service providers for aggregation. And of course, the customer is at the center of everything, whether they're initiating payments or they are requesting to have their information aggregated into one, uh, one consistent dashboard so they have one view on all of their assets and all of their financial activities. Some of the key uh, um, aspects that enable this clearinghouse to introduce this payment hub is the secure API gateway with runtime authentication. That is a full part of a platform that is satisfying the technical requirements of PSD2 as well as local country data models, as well as strict client SLAs. And a platform such as this also has to be highly scalable it has to be efficient with low processing requirements and give ample capacity for future growth. And absolutely, especially in Europe, we're all familiar with the very strict privacy guidelines around data, secure service gateways against unauthorized use with mechanisms for triggering alerts and automated responses to a wide range of threats 
and conditions. And the one last piece of this is the future introduction of a FinTech incubator which will be one of the growth engines for the clearinghouse in the future through partnerships and the ability to outsource innovation to FinTech partners. And what were the results of this, which also took place in 2018? Well, the foundation, as I mentioned, for building out a FinTech innovation incubator they were able to monetize their infrastructure by acting as a hub. So truly becoming a platform and working with this ecosystem of banks and uh, um, uh, account aggregators and third-party payment initiators. And of course, they are checking the box, being ready for the March deadline, which was around uh, having APIs available, and then the upcoming September deadline around the technical requirements of those APIs. And just a little bit about us uh, and how we were able to support these clients with very different use cases in different parts of the world to accomplish their business objectives and keep the door open for growth and scale in the future is that we are one of three companies who is ranked as a leader for API management solutions with both Gartner and Forrester. And with that, I would like to wrap things up and then pass back to Mike for a question and answer period. But just before I do that, I would like to say that if you are interested in looking at the uh, 2018 reports on API management or other pieces of our broader web methods integration platform, please go to softwareag.com and you will be able to request uh, copies of those documents to be sent to you. We also are happy to share with you a free trial period with our hybrid integration platform. And that's also available at softwareag.com uh, slash cloud. And please, if you have other questions that we're unable to answer during this teleconference, I would be happy to receive them directly. Please email me at Laura Crozier at softwareag. Dot com. And with that, I would like to pass back to Mike. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate your presentation and sharing a lot of your insights with our audience. Uh, we do have time for a couple of quick questions from our audience members, so I'd like to put them to you. The first question for you, Laura, our audience member wants to know, how would API management integrate with core banking? Hmm. Okay, um, that is not something that I have seen. I don't think it is likely that uh, any bank would want API management to touch directly on core banking. Um, but API management is part of a full integration platform and there would be other pieces of that platform that would uh, touch on the core banking, which of course has to be contained uh, you know, very securely and can't have multiple calls on it uh, on top of the, you know, the burdens that it already has. So we work with a lot of other uh, banks and other financial institutions around the world who use our top-rated integration platform to access data from core banking systems, and they do this to make this accessible to uh, more real-time systems without ripping and replacing or you know, toppling those core systems over because of uh, multiple calls that uh, just cripple the system through activity. And that's a good segue to our next question from the audience uh, who wants to know, is Software AG API management compatible with other integration platforms? Yes, absolutely. Um, the whole Software AG platform is designed to be independent, just as we are an independent company. We are not tied to any other software or ERP. Um, this is, I think, one of our historical 
strengths, and you know this is something that we are going to continue to uh, invest in. Our hybrid integration platform is market leading, and we will be, um, you know, we certainly plan to maintain and strengthen that leadership position across back-end integration, cloud integration, hybrid integration, and API management. Great. Well, that does conclude our program for today. I want to take a, a moment to, again, thank Laura Crozier for her presentation and for sharing insights with you today. Uh, once again, we'd like to acknowledge and thank Software AG for their sponsorship of today's program. And last but not least, we want to thank all of you who attended this program. We appreciate your taking time out of your busy day to learn more about this topic, and we hope that you will join us for a future web seminar brought to you by American Banker and its sponsor partners. So on behalf of our host, our sponsor, and our speaker, thank you very much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day.